So the important theme of education, I think we've heard it mentioned over and over again throughout this conference as sort of both a source and a solution to many of our challenges, uh, really leads us to this uh, session. Um, and we are absolutely delighted uh, that we can continue this session uh, and have um, our speaker, our next speaker, Mar Margaret Spellings, who is the president and CEO of Texas 2036. Um, to speak to us uh, on this important topic. As a reminder, all of our speakers' bios are on our website, and so to be efficient, please look at their bios on the website. Um, following her presentation, we will have a panel discussion on the future of education in Texas. Secretary Spellings, welcome. Thank you, Brendan. I know the, uh, this is getting to the end of the, of the program and reminds me of a of a time I was introduced as the last speaker, and uh, it went like this, Margaret Spellings, blah, blah, blah. After our last speaker, free margaritas will be served in the lobby. So I don't know if you have free margaritas coming at lunch, but I hope you're not sitting there thinking, God, let's get this over with and get to, the, get to our lunch. Anyway, thank you, Brendan, and thank you, Tamist, and thank you, David, for all the good work that you do as an organization to elevate excellence in health and medicine and science and all the good that it does for our state and, and our people. So it's a real honor to be here with you today and, and uh, visit with you about these issues. As Brendan said, I have the privilege of leading Texas 2036 and I like to say that if we were going to put it on a bumper sticker, we would say that we're trying to put together the sensible center to think long term about the most important things using tons of data. Admittedly, kind of a long bumper sticker, but our work includes the full spectrum of policy areas, including education and workforce, health and healthcare, infrastructure, natural resources, justice and safety, and state government performance. And one of our key differentiators at Texas 2036 is the hundreds of data sets that we use to ground our policies and make that information available to policymakers and the public. We're trying to get people out of their corners and onto the facts. A theme running through our work are the opportunities and challenges given our incredible population growth. And you don't have to go too far in San Antonio to see it all around you, and that's true wherever you come from. Uh, as a reminder, Texas added about more than four million people between 2010 and 2020, and about 400,000 just last year. Over the next 14 years through 2036, our bicentennial, we can expect as many as 10 million more people coming here for a grand total of about 40 million Texans. Which leads us to the central question that I'm here to discuss today, and that is, are we prepared to successfully equip millions of students and the generations who follow with the knowledge and skills that they need to earn self-sustaining jobs, provide for their families, contribute to civic life, and enjoy the American slash Texas dream. And the answer, my friends, as I'm sure you may know, is that the prognosis, to use your kind of terminology, is terrible. Unless we take decisive action to correct course and fast, we really do not have time to waste. Texas students have fallen behind their peers in other states. At, at Texas 2036, we compare ourselves against 11 other states and a little bit of a space race formulation. And when we look at the fundamental building blocks of, of a good education, reading and math, sadly, Texas dropped eight places from 37th, not the greatest, in fourth grade reading on our national assessment in 2005, now to 45th in 2019, and I think we've fallen still given COVID. And fewer than half of Texas third graders are on grade level in reading or math today. And while many of you think, well, that's not true in my public school, my public school is different, the truth is it's, you're probably not doing as well as you might think. For example, at one of the most prestigious school districts here in San Antonio, 21% of students in the district failed the state math test, another quarter passed, but needed accelerated instruction to get on track, which means that about half of those students, 47% of the kids in one of the best school districts require additional help to do grade level work. And what do you think happens when those students graduate from high school? Many of them come from more affluent families with a history of higher education, and about 86% of them go on to college, 
which sounds pretty promising until we follow the data and learn that only about half of them graduated with a degree or credential within six years. And what may surprise you is that these scores producing so few credentialed students, and that means uh, folks who have the ticket to compete uh, in the marketplace are some of the better ones and really demonstrate the severe challenge, the very audacious challenges we have as a state. Because for low and uh, low income and minority students, the situation is much, much worse. Continually stuck in failing schools, often without access to good teachers, and God bless uh, the Butt Foundation and, and Raise Your Hand Texas for doing some good work on teachers, which you'll hear about in the next panel. Rigorous curriculum materials and the type of support that students need to thrive. I believe that it's not that we're asking uh, too much of our students, it's that we're asking too little. In one Austin Middle School, only 3% of the students do math at grade level. And across Texas, 60% of all students, about 3 million, are from economically disadvantaged homes. So only 33% of these students read at grade level and 26% do math at grade level. And I know that these are outcomes that not only are unacceptable and appalling, but really bode very bad things, not only for them, uh, but for our state's future. And I think you know we need to hold uh, the expectations we have for our own children, for all of our children. So these dramatic disparities really highlight the need for a robust diagnostic system, just as you all would do in the health field, that includes assessment and accountability to help ensure our schools get students on track for success. We have to tell the truth about student achievement and hold ourselves responsible for results. So I'm concerned when some groups and legislators in Austin are fighting to reduce standards and eliminate the measurement that allows us to see where our kids are especially since the pandemic. And when we know the truth, when we understand the data and we get it there in hands that uh, can use it for action, we can challenge what my former boss used to call the soft bigotry of low expectations. Whether under the guise of local control or local politics, the arguments being made to disconnect performance from valid data that we create without the information really uh, create a real problem for our students. And unfortunately, this is a phenomenon that we see on both sides of the aisle politically, and we can talk about that uh, during the Q&A. You know, what I'm reminded of in the 1990s and the early 2000s, Texas led the nation in implementing rigorous standardized assessment and accountability, which resulted in us charting a path of better outcomes, and it resulted in states around the country copying us. At that time, statewide math scores grew by 14% within six years. And in the late 2000s, Texas reversed course, this financial crisis and so forth, and took steps to weaken this approach. And so we're seeing the fruit of that now. These are long-term problems where policy decisions don't show up for a while. That's why it was encouraging that in 2019, the Texas legislature worked to address this slide in school performance and passed House Bill 3 which was sweeping and historic, uh, provided more money for Texas teachers and put more money directly in classrooms. But unfortunately, obviously, the pandemic has slowed that bill's progress, but the data-driven system it created and the resourcing around our most significant challenges has tremendous potential to improve our schools. So I hope it's not uh, the time to turn back from those reforms that were made a couple of years ago. We must stay the course. It's also not the time to back away from the test that is often controversial that these reforms are built on. But despite what you have heard, the STAR test is written and reviewed by Texas teachers, endorsed by psychometricians and other experts, and aligned with measures like the National Assessment of Educational Progress, or NAEP, our nation's education report card. And I really want to commend Texas Education Commissioner Mike Morath, who's recently done a lot of work to improve the STAR test to make it available online and to have those results get into the hands of students and parents and educators more quickly. In medicine, lives would be at stake if parents blame the test for poor outcomes instead of working with their medical teams to focus on treatment and recovery. Some of you may recall a rather unfortunate quote by former President Trump about COVID testing where he said, if we stopped testing, we'd have fewer cases. Well, while true, uh, that's not a strategy we want to use for education. So the stakes are really high, 
And if we don't address this COVID learning loss, studies shows that we'll have more than a trillion dollars in lost economic activity during the, the student's lifetime. Uh, but the good news is we know what to do, and you're going to hear some about that uh, on our next panel. One key to success, of course, is the quality of our curricular materials and the rigor. And uh, Commissioner Morath has spoken a lot about that. Besides a teacher in the classroom, not to be minimized, but a critical aspect is the kind of instructional materials, the level of rigor, those expectations that we have for our kids. We need more materials with a research-based track record to improve student outcomes so they're not wasting time. We must raise expectations for our students, our teachers, and ourselves. We need more rigor through advanced coursework like AP and IB, and we need to be innovative about making sure that these opportunities are available to every student everywhere, irrespective of zip code or, or wealth, by closing the digital divide and leveraging new technologies. The good news now is that we have the federal funds and legislative budget commitments and the resources to do this work. All we need is the will and the expectation. But as all of you here today know, education does not and should not uh, end at high school if you're going to be an active participant in the economy. In your case, high school graduation was really just the beginning, but for too many Texas students, in fact, for the majority, that is where education ends, uh, if not before. Historically, our state has overcome these labor shortfalls through domestic and international immigration, a story that many of us share. And well-educated people move to our state all the time to create and fill good jobs. But migration patterns are volatile and have slowed periodically and can't be relied on to meet our state's workforce needs, especially when we leave so many people behind. The Texas economy as a whole and the healthcare industry in particular depends on a highly educated workforce with specialized knowledge and skills required for the jobs that are being transformed by advancements in technology. And that's why many, including Texas 2036, are supporting and hopeful that the next legislative session will be a workforce session focused on what we can do to ensure that individuals have the skills that employers need, including those in health and health care. Last year, every Texas county except for five, that's 249 out of 254, had a primary care physician shortage. Last week, the Texas Workforce Commission announced a critical shortage of about 20,000 registered nurses. At the same time, demand for healthcare occupations is expected to grow faster than all other occupations combined, and the most recent projections show that healthcare employment will grow by nearly 20% and will need about another 200,000 skilled workers. Regrettably, Texas is not yet organized for success. We have too many silos that, that don't coordinate and uh, uh, work well together, despite our spending about $100 billion per year on education and workforce programs. While 90% of our students do graduate from high school, 72% pursue a post-secondary degree or credential, but only 32% actually complete in a day and time when that is table stakes, that credential to enter and thrive in the workforce. Last session, Texas 2036 and a coalition of other organizations like Chambers of Commerce and Businesses created an effort called Aim Higher Texas, which supported legislation that, would cr that creates more effective pathways, processes, and data to do a better job of meeting these needs. And the state has, has launched uh, an effort called Building a Talent Strong Texas, which will work toward having 60% of Texans by 2030 receive and earn a credential of value, meaning something uh, that leads to a job. This, of course, must be translated to better policies and sp supports in higher ed. Our universities, community, and technical colleges are working to support programs that lead to these high demand credentials in line with key industries like healthcare, supported with grants like the Texas Reskilling and Upskilling Through Education or True program. And those grants are helping stand up short term programs that can pl be completed in six months or less providing efficient pathways into the workforce. 
Work to improve completion is also happening at the Community College Finance Commission appointed by the legislature to make sure that we're using resources wisely and well. And we at Texas 2036 have, have developed, and you can find it on our website, a community college finance simulator that allows you to manipulate the various uh, aspects of those funding systems. Through this building a talent strong Texas effort, credentials of value will transfer pathways to further education providing uh, students a realistic uh, uh, opportunity to get an affordable degree. It also, interestingly for you, reintroduces research goals for higher education institutions, calling for increased research funding and more postdocs across our state's diverse demographics. This is how we will produce more research with real world value, like when we see a pair of Houston scientists develop a patent-free, low-cost COVID vaccine that can be easily accessed and used worldwide, just one of the many, many examples we could give. Our major health and life science research hubs have been built around major academic Houstons all over our state. These are important economic and innovation engines for our state with strong PhD talent, bioengineers, biochemists, microbiologists, and many more. To help recruit Nobel laureates and members of national academies from other states, Texas has relied on an incentive program called the Governor's University Research Initiative. And while it's smart to pay accomplished people to move here, we also must find better ways for Texas students, any one of whom may be the next Nobel laureate. To create that pipeline of academics, innovators, and researchers, we'll need to support the continued alignment of academic, commercial, and medical sectors around our future workforce needs. We also need to build a large enough pipeline for other healthcare workers by ensuring we have enough educators and trainers, and we need to pay them enough to do that work and make sure training is accessible and affordable. Nursing schools and hospitals, both of which want to increase the number of students going through programs, are stuck in a loop. Nurses and understaffed units can't take on as many nursing students because of how much work they have, limiting the number of students that nursing schools can accept. If you're nursing school graduates, makes it impossible to staff appropriately. You all know all of that. To combat this cycle, the Texas Workforce Commission announced earlier, earlier this year that $15 million will be allocated to a statewide apprenticeship initiative with the goal of expanding opportunities for people interested in nursing, including completing apprenticeship programs that earn college credit. This program demonstrates the potential we have when we closely follow the data and long-term workforce trends and find ways for the state to partner with regions, industries, universities, and schools to get the job done. To get where we want to be as a state is not going to be easy in this political environment. That's why I started with our bumper sticker mission about bringing together the sensible center to think long-term about important things using tons of data. And to do that, we need to build civic demand for the issues that matter most to us and to our state. I encourage you to introduce yourselves and add your name to our email list and join one of our policy advisory groups for future events. And for those of you who want to do more, I'll leave you with a starting assignment. Last week, the state started rolling out this year's STAR test results. As they are released, I want you to look at not only how states perf the students performed across the state, but in your own neighborhood schools, and ask yourself if those results, not only for your kid, but for all of their peers, are acceptable to you. I want you to join me in having the difficult conversations in your communities that are necessary if we're going to give our students and ourselves a fighting chance at a better future. Thank you for your interest, thank you for your great work, thank you for helping build civic demand around these critical issues. Brendan. Thank you, you Secretary Spelling. Yeah. Um, we have time for questions and discussion, so Mike. Yes, can I want to acknowledge a couple of people who've been uh, valuable players in Texas 2036, Lindsay Parham, of, of San Antonio and Austin, and Elaine Mendoza, who's talking her head off over there, but about to be on, <laughs> on the panel, uh, who's an important San Antonian and a former chairman of the Texas A&M Board. They've been involved with our work. Margaret, first of all, thank you for the great work that you do and have done for years in the education arena. Thank you for being here today. I would just say Tamist has talked about education throughout 
the almost 20 years of our existence since Senator Kay Bailey Hutchinson led to our uh, formation and call on us. If ever we can help you, uh, we stand ready. Here's my question. One of our earlier speakers uh, noted that a kindergartner has bright, wide open eyes with regard to science and wants to know why the grass is green and the sky is blue. Fast forward to a 12th grader and you mention science or math and it's, Ugh, you know, mm -hmm. something happens. And um, I, I'll call it uh, maybe de-inspiration somehow that occurs. My question for you is, I wonder how much of that issue, to the extent you accept that that exists, mm -hmm. is a result of the educational process. How much of it really isn't uh, the educational system at all, but just as sort of endemic of society? Uh, and, and finally, I wonder what more we as scientists, engineers, and medical professionals, you know, the, the brain trust, if you will, of Texas can do to sort of raise that inspiration curve between uh, K and 12. But I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. And again, thank you for coming today. Thank you, David, and thank you for your leadership. I know you're looking forward to the uh, retirement phase of, your, of, this, of this role. Well, when we look at the data, here's what we see, that, that kids you know, are very interested and engaged in science pretty much through elementary school. But in middle school, frankly, because usually a lack of facility with skill uh, things kind of fall apart in middle school, that sixth, seventh, and eighth grade period. And uh, I, I think the thesis is that if you're not very good at something, you're not going to love to do it and study it. And to be, you know, tackling AP or IB or really any kind of science or math in high school, you need to have some facility, some skill uh, with those things so that you can enjoy uh, the journey of learning more. You also know that in math and science, those are, you know, building block fields that, that you know, really create a need for a strong foundation. So that's why we have to get uh, early education and middle school education much more critically focused on, on skills. And of course that starts with teachers and teaching and, and the old you can't teach what you don't know. And you know, often our, our early grade teachers are more focused and not that there's anything wrong with teaching kids to read, don't get me wrong, but uh, it's a place where I think we can skill up some of our teachers in those early grades so that that facility in, in math and science get built uh, so that they can go the distance. The other thing is, and this has been controversial in Texas, you know, eighth grade algebra is critical. You got to take it or it's the right, you know, if you don't, then, you know, you're not going to be a PhD scientist because you miss the train, you miss the boat, you miss the ability to get that cumulative learning. So another place where Texas has, has waned, but, but this organization can stand strong for take eighth grade algebra. Yes, ma'am. Hi, um, I'm Mary Pat Moyer. I have run a company called Incel Corporation. I was a professor here in San Antonio for 20 years and have been a kick-ass activist in this area for a long time. And it's always a lot of talk. And there's always a lot of talk and we don't get to the end game. Look, we're going backwards now. Mm -hmm. And we can celebrate from an earlier speaker in the, in the meeting, and you saw where there were only a handful of purple dots showing that there was any kind of health care or whatever. So, you know, we don't have enough health care for the kids. Um, so that's all part of it. So Medicaid. We don't have pre-K universal. Universal pre-K for all. There's data out there that says that is critical. Mm -hmm. And then it all doesn't start necessarily with the teachers. It can start with the parents. So why can't we think out of the box and do something like, you know, make science kits that are fun, you know, how to make a, you know, because some of us can afford to go on Amazon and buy the kits and play with our grandkids and do that kind of stuff and actually have fun science with them. But everybody can't do that. And sometimes parents feel uncomfortable with it because they don't know how cool it can be. Mm -hmm. And I think that we, we miss the boat. So when we talk about workforce, and so if the Workforce Commission has to spend most of its money on babysitting to try to get people trained in many cases, that's not a good plan. So there's a lot more to it than just, can the teachers do better? Can this do better? Can that do better? And as I hire people and they come out of college, they aren't trained to work. They may know stuff intellectually, but I still have to train them mm -hmm. over a long period of time so that they can work mm -hmm. in a real job. And 
Interestingly enough, some of the community colleges provide students that are ready to work. So there's, there's just a lot more here than just, if we throw some money at it, it'll do this and that. And then the other thing is, who's addressing the fact that we, if we're talking about history, that we don't lie, that we tell the truth. All of those kinds of things are critical because kids can see right through it. And then almost every kid from the time they can walk and pick up your phone and get into a game are gonna do it, right? So we have to rethink didactic education from a podium because kids aren't learning that way. They're already having their brains wired before they even go to school to use a phone and to get information from that source. So I think there's ways to think out of the box in that regard, and you can also then get your parents involved. Because I think that it's a much more holistic need mm -hmm. than we really look at historically. And in Texas, if we keep striving for mediocrity, that's where we're gonna be. And I mean, I'm, I'm shooting at it because I've been working in it for my whole career. So do we really address that? Will there be universal pre-K? Will kids get the health care that they need? Because that's all part of it. You can't go to school if you're hungry. So those yeah. are my points. Well, that's why we need to build what I call civic demand with our policymakers uh, for this kind of approach. And I will say one thing that we did last session was we developed a Medicaid expansion tool. We called it something else, Health Policy Explorer or something like that that allowed people to manipulate about 500 different variables on what it would take for Texas to expand Medicaid. And essentially showed our state policymakers that for virtually no cost, mm -hmm. we could right. expand Medicaid, better leverage federal dollars, increase, but they don't do it. increase care, et cetera. Well, we made a little progress. We got postpartum women covered for a longer period of time and made it easier for kids to stay enrolled. I mean, these are, you know, Kay Hutchison, people who work around legislative bodies know that you know, these are incremental uh, uh, ideas, and we have to continue to talk to our elected officials. That's how it works. And, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, and that's why the squeaky wheels in education are working to, uh, you know, uh, sort of retreat on some of the things that we've talked about, and, you know, although they are for additional resources. So I think the other thing that strikes me about your comment is, we need to kind of think uh, systemically about who ought to do what. The kinds of things you're talking about ought to be reserved in many cases to you know, local school districts, but they need data, they need resources, they, you know, what is it the state and federal government are supposed to do to create the conditions uh, for you know, enhanced learning? That isn't gonna happen in Austin, Texas, or Washington, D.C., that's gonna happen within every individual classroom. And so, again, why it's important for us to get engaged locally around these issues. But when it's, but when it's property tax based, there's gonna be a, a disparity as far as where the funding comes from. Yeah, and that's why you know House Bill 3, this law I mentioned, was so important uh, in, in trying to resource exactly where the most significant challenges are. So thank you for your comment. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So my, I'm a university professor and I've been teaching organic chemistry and it took me a long time to start, you know, analyzing what's happening in high school and finally reach out to, you know, chemistry high school teachers, community colleges. And I think this is something is lacking for uh, research universities because the pressure is always on get your uh, research grant. Mm -hmm. And I think we can do a lot more, you yeah. know. We also run programs with the Boy Scouts and I actually was amazed to learn that 10, 12 years old kids have a genuine interest in learning about science. But I think we're lacking on that because we are so focused on that. And I myself at times, you know, uh, look at myself and I see the focus, I need a grant. And I think at times this is the, you know, a missed opportunity. So you, I Amen. do encourage, you know, university professors to break away a little bit from the research grant and look at education. It is important. Those are going to be our students in college. I couldn't agree more with you. And I see Dean Martinez there from the University of Texas at Austin, who leads the ed school there, who's going to talk with you in a minute. But, you know, our public universities especially have to be part of the solution here on research and practice that can, can change the, the kind of data that I've talked about here. And we actually are involved in creating 
the framework for something like this that could work around the country that could harness our public universities around our shared challenges. It's all the same. But it took the, the brain research people and the national institutes to tackle how we teach little children to read about 20 years ago. And, and that research that came from the scientific community is what really changed the nature of reading instruction. So um, amen, amen, amen. Go tell your boss. <laughs> You know, I would just uh, maybe as a last comment there, there's a theme here that I think uh, pervaded this morning, and David, you pointed to it, which is, you know, what's our role and what can we do as, you know, research institutions? And uh, the previous uh, discussion with the leaders of the National Science Foundation underscored, I think, two important themes of our domestic workforces, which is so critical, but how do we incentivize and get past and really uh, stimulate participation? And I think that one of the models that we in the sort of research field focus on in terms of our training is that of modeling. Mm -hmm. We are models and it's an apprenticeship and I think changing incentives in higher education so that we go into the community mm -hmm. to, to inspire and to model and to mentor, because we all agree this is all about mentoring this organization, but to reach even further earlier into that pathway. And, uh, but it's about changing incentives because that, the okay. issue of promotions came up. If one incentivizes our institutions to reward community engagement and mentoring, then we're doing our part in spite of whatever external resources are available or not. Or tailoring your research around the things that we need to know to correct right. the situation. Thank you all. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Chris.